Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for making it a full house here. It's also a lot of people on Zoom. Really great. Happy New Year 2024. Um, I'm Robert Villa, the president of the Tucson Herb Society. Um, welcome new members or new people, regardless of whether you're a member or not. Um, it's great to know that herbs have health in Tucson. Um, so, um, this is our logo and this is our mission statement. Um, I should say that I'm going to be doing lots of back and forth because I have to let people into the meeting room. So, um, if I all of a sudden do this, uh, that's why. Helps to turn it on. Oh. Okay. So, Skudash. Let me say that. Skudash. Good day to you. That is uh, how you say hello in autumn, which um, Tucson is on the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham people, and as well as many other diverse uh, indigenous people. Tucson, Southern Arizona is filled with autumn place names named after herbs. For example, I work on Tumac Hill or Chemamac Dolag, which is Horned Lizard Hill. And the Catalinas uh, from Tumamac Hill, you'll see this is Push Ridge. And looking north, that is the profile of a giant sitting toad. And it's why the Catalinas are called Baba Doag or Toad Mountain. And here's the west side of Push Peak, which looks like the dorsal surface of a giant toad. There's also a place called Snake Town, which in autumn means sure are a lot of rattlesnakes around. <laughs> so since this is the first uh, meeting of the year, I'd like to recognize our friends and partners. Um, that uh, we have collaborated with. Uh, the, the Cecil Schwalbe Cold-Blooded Research Fund was established by Carol Schwalbe, who's here tonight um, for um, fish and, uh, well, cold-blooded research, uh, herbs and fish. Um, we've collaborated with Greater Good Charities, which we'll learn about uh, in a little bit. Um, our friends Fauno are a group in Baja, California that works to monitor small invertebrates or small vertebrates and uh, riparian ecosystems, especially herbs. Um, and then Cream Design and Print, who uh, make the Save the Sonoran, Protect the Sonoran Desert Toad uh, design, which uh, funds our Sonoran Desert Toad Fund. So we also have some swag, which I'm wearing our newest uh, item, the baseball cap. And uh, we sold out very recently. If you'd like to buy any of our merchandise, uh, see Maggie uh, at the back of the room. And uh, it'll, it'll help us continue to do the things that we do, like the Charles Lowe Herb Research Fund, um, which we uh, sponsored four projects last year. And the Sonoran Desert Toad Fund. So if you go to Cream, um, the, the shop, um, most of the items with this logo uh, of proceeds go into our Sonar Desert Toad Fund. And uh, we funded four very great projects last year to understand the needs of the species. Um, at our silent auction um, and merchandise, or at our meeting in November, we raised almost $1,000. So thank you for, for those of you who participated. Here's a wonderful print by Bettina Jones. Uh, Day of the Dead Gila Monsters. Um, we also help sponsor the publication of books. And um, the most notable one uh, tonight is uh, the Venomous Animals uh, book and the, um, or excuse me, the Lizards book, which Larry Jones authored. Um, so Snakes of Arizona started a series uh, in which the amphibians and lizards and turtles are going to be treated. And so this website, you can upload images and observations to help with that project. Um, so um, Larry Jones is one of the editors of the lizard volume. And it turns out that he became the recipient of the Jarko Conservation Award, which was established in 1992 
to honor James Jerko, a reptile amphibian veterinarian here in Tucson who uh, exemplifies service to the conservation of our uh, amphibians and reptiles of, of the deserts of North America. And so the award recognizes people who have done a lot uh, and not really been recognized uh, sufficiently enough. So uh, Larry, congratulations. Thank you. So we're going to have a, um, a get together to award Larry on March 30th at Mission Garden. Uh, I, we're still working on the time, but it'll probably be around 4, 4 or 5 p.m. in the day. And uh, just stay tuned for, for more information. So um, besides that, there are a number of things you can get involved with, and you don't have to know how to handle reptiles or amphibians or snakes. Uh, you just have to have enthusiasm. Um, so we've got a lot of stuff. And there's um, the uh, SciFest at the Children's Museum. We're going to be judging uh, projects at the Southern Arizona uh, Science and Engineering Fair, the Tucson Festival of Books, and then these really great conferences that um, you can volunteer to um, staff an information table for THS. This is our new color photo or uh, color or photo cover, excuse me, of Sonoran Herpetologist. Uh, this is our, our recent one. And finally, Paul Mayer is uh, searching for help with Tucson Gila monsters. Um, Tucson Festival of Books. Uh, Lee Oler here has a sign-up sheet. So if you're interested in volunteering on Saturday, it's the first Saturday and Sunday, I believe, of March. It says 9th and 10th, the 9th and 10th of 10th. March. Yeah, so we'd love to have you help handle snakes and talk to kids about snakes and lizards and hand out coloring books and stuff like that. Um, By the way, stop just for a second. Yeah. I know a lot of you in this room from years ago, and I know your names, I know your phone numbers. So if you <laughs> want to help, please sign up tonight. I've got the list here. It runs for two days, and it it kind of tapers off, seems like, at 5 or 6 o'clock. Yeah. So it's not an evening thing, but yeah. it's all day for two days. And I will have some board members calling you if you don't sign up tonight. So please consider this. <laughs> and I learned from Matt that it's um, during spring break, which is kind of a problem. Is, is that right? Do I have that right? Oh, <laughs> eh, 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 that was not a definite answer. Well, even if it is during spring break, come and see me and sign up for a couple hours because it's a lot of fun. And, and these kids really need to learn a lot more. I should be standing up, but not. Um, I'm not, uh, they, they really like to come and they ooh and ah over the snakes and they're, of course, they're not poison snakes. They're mostly like king snake. What else? No, I got a king no snake. No medically last year. significant snakes. What? No medically harmful snakes. Yeah. Because some well, of them are venomous. But... Nobody will get um, be taken to the hospital because of the snakes. <laughs> and and there's also some in cases so that are a little yeah. more, uh, they're little, they're too little to handle. I mean, you don't want kids petting them. Yeah. And, but the big, I, I don't know what I had last year. Uh, you had a gopher snake. And I had a gopher snake. So we we always, we've made the front page of the newspaper. So we're kind of like uh, the main, like a popular attraction. at Very the popular. Science. They were lined up to pet the gopher snake. Yeah. So, At the end of the day, he was, if a snake could curdle into the fetal position. He was tired. <laughs> but anyhow. Yeah, he was tired. I have this chat sign up page here and I have a pencil. I have two or three pencils. So please see me before you leave. I really appreciate it because otherwise, I think Maggie made me do it. Maggie will be very upset if you don't sign up. And we don't <laughs> want Maggie upset. <laughs> right, Maggie? Yeah. 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 See? So somehow. Thank All you. Right. So before I introduce our next speaker, um, we have a YouTube channel. So we're being recorded right now um, so that people who can't, couldn't make it tonight can um, watch the, the, um, the presentations. Um, and so this year we're going back to an every other month uh, presentation. So every odd uh, numbered month, we will have a meeting here um, and that's how it will be. So, 
Um, this is one of my best friends, Tom Van Devender. And um, I, there are a lot of great things we could say about him. Um, he is affectionately known in Mexico as uh, one of the uh, famous uh, celebrity botanists of Mexico's Northwest and affectionately known as Planta Claus. Um, I'll never forget the day that he, I was in Sonora with him and I was really excited about all the cool reptiles and amphibians I was going to uh, uncover in the Sierra Baca de Huachi. And we did, but he said, um, that's great, but I want you to come back with 10 plants that are different and uh, you'll have to learn their names by the end of the, of the trip. And um, I didn't realize it, but once there was a plant press in my backpack, um, I couldn't stop collecting plants. And I, was obs I became obsessed with with field botany because of him. And the funny thing is that he also started out as a herpetologist. And so? Yeah. Paul Martin started that. Ah. He taught a uh, you know, paleoecology and math class and he had every student had to collect 10 plants mm -hmm. and learn their names by the end of the course. Mm -hmm. Tom uh, was a student of Paul Martin, who um, was one of the directors of the Desert Laboratory and um, Tom and uh, Julio Bettencourt and Paul Martin pioneered the study of pack rat midden analysis. So basically, a pack rat builds a house and it has a latrine and it preserves over thousands of years that excrement turns into something called amber rat and it preserves the plant material because of carbon dating we can get a, an approximate understanding of what the past looked like, the, the landscape looked like. Um, Tom has led uh, several expeditions, binational expeditions to understand biodiversity in the Sky Islands of Sonora. And they've been highly successful. They are great bio, bio blitzes and parties uh, between professionals, specialists, and students from all over the all over the place. Um, so um, I would like to introduce Tom, if you could come up and talk to us about the box turtles of Sonora, uh, because we all love turtles. I'll share it with So um, forward, backward, and then the laser is right here. Okay. I like centered them, so. Yeah. You can stand here, you can stand in the middle, wherever you like. Hey, it's great to be here. Um, we, we've done a lot of different projects going on, and we studied a lot of different plants and animals. But I started off as a herpetologist, and my heart's still there for some things. But we had a, a, a Duran Discovery expedition to a ranch called Rancho El Charababi. And one of the, it was up in the Oak Woodland, and one day we were there, and my wife, Aunt Olivia, back there found a, a shell of a turtle sitting in the bush. And, you know, well, okay, it looked like a mud turtle, it looked like a kind of cerna. So, you know, Steve Hale was there, Betsy Burton was there, and I was there. And, so we're all standing around looking at this thing and we turned it over and said, I think it's a box turtle. And he says, but just a shell, we can't tell what it is. He says, we need to look for the scoots on it. So one of the guys got down on his hands and knees and started breaking the leaves and found the epidermal scoots and they were spotted. And so it was a, a Nelson's box turtle way far north. And that was when, and people like Beto have been interested in box turtles forever. Lee's kept them forever as pets. And uh, so, but this this was a stimulus to go ahead and put together a bunch of information about box turtles from Sonora. So um, we'll go ahead and go. So the two species of box turtles, the one on the left is Terrapini nelsoni. It's either called the 
spotted box turtle or the Sierra box turtle. Um, the one on the right is the ornate box turtle. How do you? One is. How do you do this? Uh, just uh, point it to here. Try right, again. Not doing anything. Point to the right. Yeah, okay. This, one thing we always do on this, we go through the databases, we go through the uh, the online databases, the University of Arizona Museum collections, uh, our personal observations, and anything that's in our, our Madrid and Discovery Exhibition database, pull together all of the records for the things you're going to talk about. So we ended up getting 72 records for uh, Terpini Nelson I and 37 records for the for the ornate box turtle in Sonora. Um, by the way, that that's that's the um, website address for the for the ex, for, for the database. It is the biggest best source of biological information for the state of Sonora. There are thousands and thousands of records of herbs and birds and plant everything. Now, um, I'll just go through these one by one and, and sh uh, show a little bit. Um, the spotted box turtle terrapinny nelson, I can either have a, a dark, dark, dark brown or almost black brown color with spots on it, or it could be like this one, which is more of a reddish color. Um, this, this animal, well, this is a, a northern subspecies of it. The, the species was described from Nairo Reef way in the southern end of the Sierra Madre Occidental. And then um, later, Charles Bogert found them at Wiracoba outside of Alamos. And um, so they described a new species. This was, a, uh, this was in 1943 in the middle of World War II. He couldn't really examine specimens, so he named it Terrapini clabberi. And then, you know, very quickly, they realized that it, it was the same animal that had been described in Nairid and just raised it to a subspecies. Um, now, the one on the top right up there, we've run into a couple, a couple of old, really old individuals. That was an old, old animal there that had lost all of its cover, color, and got sort of this yellow bottle pattern. And um, the one about here is one that Michael Bogan saw on the Rio Aros, and it's a big old animal, but it actually got to the point where the scoots are degrading and bone is being shown. It's still alive, still well, but that's not an old one. Uh, the one on the bottom right, uh, this box turtle has a black plastron. It's one of the key characters for this spotted with the black plastron. Okay, now a little bit about the habitats of the spotted box turtle. This is the, the tropical one. The species distribution is from Diary, and I guess it's recently been discovered in Zacatecas, north through the Sierra Madre, Sinaloa, and the Sonora. And a few records from Chihuahua over just east and east of the Sonora boundary. Um, now, uh, last fall we had a talk here about the population study of the spotted box turtle near Alamos, and then this amazing study by a tired Butterfield where he marked, marked, and recaptured a very large number of them. And it was in Pine Oak Forest, and he claimed he told us that that was the preferred habitat of the box turtles. And he'd gone down in tropical deciduous forests and looked for them and couldn't find them. And he found some in Oakwood. But he, he said pine oak forest was a preferred habitat. Well, when we, we did the analysis of these 72 records we had, we found that it's much more common in tropical habitats. That in the Montreal Espinoso, which is foothill thorn scrub, 42% of the localities were in that habitat. Another 24% were in tropical deciduous forest. Um, oak woodland is pretty common. They can be common. So they're 22, 23%. But in pine oak forest, there are only six, six and a half percent records. So Taggart's locality is one of the few localities that's actually in pine oak forest. So it's not the typical habitat for the species. It's an or. Anyway, but um, by getting large samples of these and look at the habitat and the vegetation, you can learn quite a bit about them. Okay, now these, these are uh, samples of the ornate box turtle, Terpene ornata. It's a subspecies Ludiola, 
which is from the western part of the Great Plains through New Mexico and Texas and into Sonora. And there's an eastern subspecies, the term Ornata Ornata, that's uh, further east in the Great Plains, as far north as Illinois and places like that. Uh, the one on the top is a fairly typical adult. They have that starburst pattern. And quite a few of the, the, of the eastern box turtles on them have that as well. The one on the right is an old individual that's turned into, uh, where the pattern's been lost. It's gone to a horn color. Uh, out of the 37 animals that we saw, that was the only one that had this kind of pattern. George Ferguson told us, told us that further east in some of the literature, that's a common, um, that both males and females, when they get old, they will switch to a horn colored pattern like that. Uh, we have a, that's the only one we've seen in Sonora that looked like that. Um, the one on the bottom left is an interesting one that, that uh, uh, this, uh, we're not sure, but it's apparently this animal was caught in a, in a fire. And so it's all damaged and the bones exposed. And uh, you can see it's chewed up in here. And very often after those situations, rodents will come along and chew on them. So anyway, but that, uh, but it's still alive. This was at the edge of Alopieta, still alive. One on the right shows the bottom, the bottom pattern of Ornata with it. It is, it is, you know, has a star pattern on the bottom of that. Now a little bit about habitats of these. Um, a number of the, the spent records, we couldn't tell exactly what habitat it was on the long highways or in agricultural fields. And the ones we really could, um, more than 40% of them were found in grassland, either desert grassland or plains grassland. Or, or, and the grassland is just right at the, the northeastern fringe of, the, of Sonora from essentially um, Naco and Cananea east all the way to the Chihuahua border. There, there's good grasslands. They were also found in Chihuahua Desert Scrub. And that's not too surprising because Chihuahua Desert Scrub and Desert Grassland form a mosaic all the way across the southwest of most of the northern Chihuahua Desert. And very often you'll get desert grassland on the deep soils and you'll get Chihuahua Desert on the rocky slopes. So those, those two habitats are really very closely related. Um, so uh, I haven't been mentioned, but the, the maps or the distribution maps there, the yellow spots is or not. Um, we just submitted a paper putting all the results of distribution ecology that will be in the next um, uh, Sonoran Herpetologist. So there'll be a, you know, a nice write up of, of this information. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute, but notice this one here, way down here, far away from the other ones here. Okay, now, um, <laughs> box turtles are often found on highways and uh, along riverbeds, and quite a few of the spotted box turtles were found <clears throat> along the um, Rio Paros here. That's, that's a... a tributary of the Rio Yaqui and, and uh, Eastern Sonora. Very, very rich storm scrub along there, but uh, people were active down the river to see them there. Um, the, anyway, but what I'm getting at is that there are sort of natural corridors. They can follow riparian uh, rivers or the floodplains, so they can go follow along those, as well as being in the upland natural habitats. Um, they can, uh, I'll show one later, but they can, they also can follow highways. And they also turn up in, in uh, agricultural fields which have artificial water. So it's kind of hard to tell what the natural habitat of some of those, some of those places are. The, the bottom photograph there is the Rio Cuchuhaki outside of Alamos. And uh, Terrapini Nelson and I is, it's hard to find, but it seems to be scattered throughout the tropical deciduous forests around Alamos. Okay, now box journals have a strange relationship with. Oh, I think you skipped two slides. So here's the original one, and here's the next one. Okay. Um, yeah, when they started this, it was assumed that there was no sympatry between the two species of box journals here. They're both put in the, in the Ornata group of box turtles, 
and that's as opposed to the Carolina group, the Eastern Box Service. There's two major divisions within the bee genus Terrapini, and the Western group is just these two species form the Western group. And it was sort of assumed that there was no uh, overlap at all for them, but um, the the record that started this particular project was right here. And so this is outside of Kapoor Bay and the southernmost Ornata is right here. And uh, so it looks like the ranges overlap at least that far. But it's not that simple because the, the Nelson I was up on a ridge in Oak Woodland, natural Oak Woodland habitat. And the, um, the Ornata down there at Wet Buck, near called Country, was in an agricultural field outside of the high outside of the town along the highway. So there's always a possibility that it was transported south, or that all along the Rio Sonora there's there's, there's scattered populations of the thing in there. So, but anyway, there was a potential overlap there. Um, it is another another factor is it. See the brown color here? That's all Foothill Swan Scrub. And the Sierra Conchi right outside of here has got both Oak Woodland and Foothill Swan Scrub, two of the prime habitats of Nelson I. And so if they're actually, if you go in there and explore, you might well find that um, the spotted box turtle naturally on the upland habitats here. Then you can have, have Ornata along the, the Rio Sonora Valley. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship of roads there. That um, this, this one here is that picture of that animal that was found at, at Wepa. That's that southernmost morning uh, box turtle locality. It, not a very good photograph and didn't look like too healthy of an animal, but it was in an agricultural field near town. Um, the one on the right there is a specimen that's in the U.S. National Museum that um, Charles Bogart collected in 1953 at Wyness. So you can see from the little map here, that's the southernmost record that we, we know for sure. That specimen was collected way the hell down here. And it's, it's either Sonoran Desert or Thorn Scrub Transition. Today, it's along the highway, it's completely invaded by buffalo grass, but that's a huge range extension and the habitat, none of that habitat is suitable for a box turtle. In 1953, one of the only major highways was Mexico 15, that went from Nogales south straight through there and then all, all the way down, you know, all, all the way down western Mexico. So I think it's very likely uh, in general, everybody discounts that specimen as one that's been transported to there and not a reliable. Um, of course, uh, highways are a major cause of mortality. It's also a place where somebody, uh, a curious person might pick one up and take it home as a pet. So highways are, you know, um, there may be a natural dispersal corridor along the pseudo riparian habitats along highways or there may be causes of mortality or, or um, people pick them up as pets. Now I'll go a little bit, of, we're, we're, um, we started this paper and it, 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 like a lot of papers often do, it's sort of, it's like adding yeast to bread, it grew and grew and grew. We got interested in the fossil history of box turtles and so what we've ended up doing is splitting all of that out, and that'll be a future paper, which we're working on now. But box turtles are one of the few herbs that have a good fossil record, relatively good. And this, all of these spots represent places that have been fossil box turtles reported in the literature. And, and all of the circles to the right are for Terrapinny, Carolina, one of the few triangles that are pretty, actually pretty far north up here, um, anyway, but the triangles up at the top up there are for uh, ornate box turtles. 
And uh, the fossil record goes back into the late Miocene, Miocene. And uh, uh, the older records are they're two extinct subspecies. They, there's a Terrapini Carolina Putnami was was a little bit was one that was recognizably different from most of those Florida records and all the ones that are older than Pleistocene. And those up the north up there are are uh, Terrapini ornata longi insulate. So it's an extinct subspecies of the ornate box tree. Uh, and just remember this map because this, um, there's, there's only one fossil box turtle record from all of Mexico. And we got it about right here. And it wasn't identified as species. So uh, it's a complete absence of fossil records south of the border. Okay. Let's get to this. William Milstead was a great box turtle biologist and paleontologist, worked out of Florida in the 1960s. And he published three, three really important papers in 1965, 66, and 67 about the, the uh, taxonomy of, of box turtles, the fossil record, and the evolution of it. This diagram on the right is his, his idea of what what the evolution of the box turtles was at the time. We used to call that an evolutionary tree, and I don't know what they call it today. But, but um, the, several other things, this, is, this was based on his idea of osteology and the modern uh, taxonomy of, of box turtles. And what he concluded was that um, Anyway, what to see on the thing on the right, look, way down in the bottom, there's several branches there. And off the bottom of the thing, it said a, a Clemmies like ancestor. Clemmies is the Western box turtle. And I'll back up a little bit that uh, four different genera of turtle were put in a separate subfamily and the, the Amidae turtles. So there was Terrapini, the box turtles, Clemmies, the Western con turtles. Uh, Emidornia was is the uh, bog turtle of eastern Europe, and Emmys, which is a European thing. So those four genera were all lumped together based on morphological characters. And he thought that Clemmys down here in the west, something like that, was the ancestor of the box turtles. Um, but another interesting thing to point out is that, uh, well, two more up in here, this fork up in here, that the um, Spotted box turtle group splits off before before the ornate box turtles. So I mean that implies that they evolved earlier than than the modern ornate box turtles. And up at the top right, that that, that uh, branch is covered up by whatever that is up there. It's the Coahuila box turtle. There's an endemic box turtle in the Quatro Cienegas basin that lives in. It's this big closed basin. It's got lots of water. It's mostly it has gypsum, lots of gypsum flats and gypsum sand dunes and gypsum in the water. And there's an endemic box turtle there that's returned to the water. It's aquatic. I'll show you a picture later, but it it's it's a uh, looks more like a mud turtle than a than a box turtle. Here's a we've got May 1996, a little bit later. He did, did a, a statistical analysis of 32 physical characters of box turtles, came up with his own phylogeny. And the interesting thing to see here again is that this, this branch that goes up to Terrapini Nelsoni came off earlier than the modern ornate box turtles. Okay, uh, put that in a little bit of context. Milstead, his idea of evolution to these. And it's a it's a good discussion, and he knew his characters extremely well. But he he basically decided that he was going to back up north to south evolution in box turtles, because all the fossils were up in the Midwest and the eastern end. He says that's where they had to evolve, and that that, that something like Ornata during a Pleistocene interglacial 
moved into Sonora, went up in the Sierra Madre, and gave rise to the spotted box turtle, you know, in the last two million years. And uh, so he also said that the the um, Coahuila box turtle was just a very young offshoot of the, the eastern box turtle with Carolina group. Okay, now um, what we're going to do is we're going to end up rewriting Bill Stead's evolutionary model for box turtles completely because in 1967 he had pretty limited knowledge about the, the evolution of the landscape and, and a lot of other things. And um, this map here shows that sort of the general Cordillera connection between Mexico, those up here, into the Rocky Mountains. So there's a gap now, but the Rockies and, and the um, Sierra Madre Occidental, they're, they're facing part of the same linear mountain range feature. Um, on the right there is sort of the main uh, geographic sections of, of Mexico, the Sierra Madre Occidental on the left, Sierra Madre Oriental on the east, and in between is the Mexican Plateau. And uh, what, what's important to know now is that the the uplift of the Sierra Madres, and it was in the late Oligocene, early Miocene. And so before that, there was continuous tropical vegetation over across all across Mexico. The entire country was tropical. When the mountains went up, it created these east-west barriers. And then the main tropical uh, habitats were restricted to the coast of the continent and further south. So, and the Mexico, Mexico Plateau was uplifted so, and it, 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 the low point of the Mexican Plateau is the Rio Grande right there on the U.S. border. And you get Chihuahua Desert Scrub almost eight or 9,000 feet in the south end of it. But it's a cold, high plateau there. Um, so a lot of, most of this happened, were, you know, the knowledge of this was after Milstead worked on his, his final entry of the uh, Fox now, this is essentially his, his north to south model. And the one up there, he basically said that <clears throat> the Terrapini ornata ludiola, the, you know, the western box turtle, or a box turtle we have, was one of the ancestral types. It, it gave rise to ornata ornata, the one that east that goes up to Illinois. And it also, sort of had some connection to the Sierra Madre. And from that, all of the Nelson and I evolved from that. So that was a north-south kind of a model. And I don't, I haven't worked out the details yet, but the Carolina was the same sort of thing. We have Terrapini Carolina in the eastern United States into Texas and south. In this area, you get Terrapini Mexicana, and on the Yucatan Peninsula, way down there, you have Terrapini yucatana. But those have been considered subspecies of, of the eastern box turtle or separate species, either one. But that was a north to south kind of model. Now, what we're going to be proposing is the exact, what I got to give Bill Strait credit. He says, maybe it really happened from south to north. But then he discounted it for the other reasons that he stated. But uh, we're fairly sure that it did happen that way for, for a number of reasons. He pointed out that the, the most primitive box turtle living today is the Terrapini Nelsoni Nelsoni, the one from Nayarit. So the very southernmost Sierra Madre Occidental has got the, the, the characteristics that would be closest to whatever the ancestor of the box turtles were. Okay. And um, he also said that the only the only box turtles of all that have that strongly flared uh, margins on the back there is um, Terrapini Carolina Major, the, big, the biggest of the eastern subspecies, and Nelson not here. So the, the, one, the northern ones don't have it. So what we're, but, uh, what we're uh, proposing is a twist from just north to south, because the Sierra Madre Occidental runs here. Um, Terrapini and Nelson I is on the Pacific slopes of the Sierra Madre and in the tropical lowlands down below. So it's, it's a tropical vegetation and the, the woodlands of the Sierra Madre. 
But uh, what I think happened is that long ago, as well, the, the split is known from the, the late Miocene. I think sometime in the early Miocene, when these mountains were just being uplifted, there was some ancestor down there, and the first box turtles were evolving. And they went, I think the ancestor of what was over here, they went north on the east side of the Sierra Madre. They went, and there's there's an old fossil record of, of a Gila monster, a Gila, Gila derma, from the Miocene of the Big Bend. So there was a, it was much more tropical on the south end of the, the Mexico Plateau. And I think that was probably the corridor that led the, the Ornata group to get up to, to reach Arizona on the east side. And it swings back across. And they come together in Sonora, but it has nothing to do with each other. They're separated by, you know, uh, at least 10 million years of evolutionary separation between the two. You've got one lineage that comes up uh, on the east side of the plateau, and the other one gets up into Sonora, where we're talking about. And they don't really come together, but they're both in the Ornata group, but they're they're quite distant. So this is we're going to be fleshing out the details on this. This this this. Uh, there's been a lot written about this, and there's a lot of things to, to sort out, but we'll be working with that soon. Okay, now, for those of you that haven't seen the Coelho box turtle, uh, you go over there, and this, there's all this water, and there's all these endemic cichlid fishes and, and uh, aquatic plants, and crawling around under the water on the bottom in the mud is, is a turtle. And it looks for all the world like a kind of sternum. But you can see that looks about like one up there. Um, but uh, when you get one out and turn it turn it sideways, uh, anyway. But when you look at them closely, they are actually a, a box turtle. It has a higher shell, and the, the scoots are much more like a box turtle. What is interesting? Look at that scoot pattern in the middle. It has this. Very strange reticulate pattern on there that I haven't seen in any other box turtles. So, but that's the one that's endemic to the Puerto Santa Cruz Basin, uh, which is a which is a protected natural area, and um, except for the uh, they're extracting the water for to make yogurt and things like that, uh, uh, it's it's protected. So anyway, let's let's finish up with that. If you got any questions, let's go. Let's do them. Thank you, Tom. Yep. <laughs>
to make him 80 years old. But I think that flair where he can get one leg out and just flip himself right back up. And I I don't I haven't seen a lot of box turtles that can do that because um they can't a lot of them. I've had some that have died. Oh, the one that your brother brought from wherever. Did you, oh my yeah, your brother, oh. Wayne, brought from um wherever. He was taking his kids, his college students on it. A trip, and he decided that that box turtle spent enough time in that bag and the bus, so he gave it to the turtle. <laughs> and, and that turtle had, was very round, no flare at all, and so had a hard time getting out of, you know, if it was in a bad position, she couldn't get out. Um, but this this old, this one I have, my very first, can just flip right, flip himself right back over. So you were talking about some turtle there that was flared. And I think we all agree that my box turtles are all, there's, there's a little bit of a hybridish business going on in there for a while, but they're all ornate luteolas. Um, anybody yeah. here want to oh, corroborate with that? That'd be great. I like see it. It. Yeah, so oh. that's, that's how long mine have lived. And I rarely have lost a box. I lost a couple they were hibernating and then the ants got through them mm -hmm. and that was very bad that, well that was really Maybe bad one time. no they were full size one was not an ordinary luteola it was some child at school brought me a turtle and said miss oler um here I mean, it's, I, it's, <laughs> such, it's interesting to note that if you look at other forest turtles uh like in madagascar and in India, they have striped shells look like uh, ornate box turtles. That's interesting. So I think I think the striping of oh. of the shells has to do with um, camouflage. I don't know the answer to your question, but there have been two or three um, natural natural history studies, long term natural history studies of box turtles in the in the east. There, there, it's in the literature. There's some some people that have kept marked them and, and followed them for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm pretty sure there would be a number out there on how many years. But that's amazing. Someone is, that sounds like my, my desert tortoise is about the same age. <laughs> so Colin Barnett is asking the conservation status of Ludiola in Mexico and that um, what preys on them. In New Mexico, raccoons are a major predator. What do you say in New Mexico? That raccoons eat them. I don't know that they're specifically protected in Mexico at all, so mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't know of any specific protections yeah. status for them in, in Sonora. Um, um, but oh, I was just going to say that I had a Carolina that was at least fifty years old. It's completely bald, essentially, and it lived to another. Eight years after I got it. So close to 60, anyway. What do you mean by bald? He lost the scoots? Or... I'm sorry? What bald. was bald mean? He looked he looked bald because the scoots were all, you know, worn off. They just got uniform color? No. Yeah. yeah. Well, George Ferguson told, told me that he had eight Ludiolas that he kept as a pet for a long time. And all eight of them turned that horn color. Eventually, males and females. So, I guess further east, that's a possibility. Um, uh, about the horn color and the stripe, I think the ornado, ornado has bigger stripes or wider apart. Who does? The ornado, ornado. We didn't talk about that tonight, but the yeah. luteola, the stripes are the radiations are. Narrower and closer together. Yeah. I think they and have more stripes. That, yeah, yeah, because there's room for more if they're closer together. And this is something that Dr. Jarko taught me many years ago. And so, uh, and also, I was under the impression, might have been a wrong impression, but that the males had more of that solid horn color from the beginning. I mean, as a younger turtle. And they also had the red eyes, at least in the luteola, luteola, uh, luteola. 
No, I'm not yeah. sure, but I don't know about they have the red eyes for yeah. sure. But uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's another way to tell male from female. George said both males and females turn more colored with age, so I don't. I don't know about I'll have to do an inventory because I have nine box turtles at home <laughs> and I think about eight of them are female. And sort of see. <laughs> you got a good starter colony. Don't I you? do, yes. <laughs> you sort of see the red eye in this male right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's... And he's got a big beak. I laughed because I, I just read about the, um, the Los Angeles County Zoo got three. Um, Trinosoma azio, it's a big horn lizard from southern Mexico. They got three of them, one, one female and two males. And that started a colony with those three animals and it's still going. We've been over 70 individuals generated from those three. So you and your eight females, you could, <laughs> you could populate Tucson with them. <laughs> that's, that's why uh, the male is in his own little... <laughs> heaven back there. Sure. So, Tom, there's some people uh, asking, uh, do they use rodent burrows like they do in Arizona? What's that? Do the uh, ornate box turtles use rodent burrows in Sonora just like they do in Arizona? Probably, but nobody studied the ecology of them down there at all. Hmm. I, would, I would imagine. Yeah. So, but, from, you know, uh, my brother Wayne came through one time and he had been leading a, a field trip from North Carolina. And they stopped and excavated a, a, one of the big uh, big kangaroo rat mounds, the big mounds. And he found two adult box turtles down in the bottom of it. Uh, they, uh, he brought them to my house and they were so vigorous. That when he came back the next year, I had him take them back and release them. <laughs> <laughs> they were fighting. Oh, yeah. So, the males fight. Oh. Well, you mentioned the riparian corridors as box turtle population, um, as where box turtles can move. Do you think that they actually move across the landscape using riparian corridors, or are there actual the populations in the riparian areas? Do they move across the landscape? Do they move across the landscape? So, do they use the, the rivers as actual corridors, or are there actual populations in the in the riparian areas. I think they live there. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're fine there, but it's just, you know, I don't know. N natural dispersal. Yeah, natural dispersal. Yeah. You know, they'll be fine along there. Huh? You know, all that details of ecology, nobody's really studied it. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know. But... Hey, Tom, this this pattern oh, of- Just two weeks ago, they had a uh, program on uh, a new area of ecology, referring to as road ecology. And uh, it's interesting, you're talking about this cute old right brain habitat along the road. Yeah. Uh, with more and more roads than we see, especially to the west, uh, yeah. what kind of an impact? You kind of alluded to this. But you see more of these box turtles that are coming along the roads in those pseudo right brain habitats? Like I say, it's a mixed bag if, if, if they can. If it's a little bit wetter along the highway than it is out away from there, they they might live along there and, and, and expand their range. But at the same time, they get killed on highways all the time. So I, I don't know. But we had one, Dale, well, Dale we had one that was on Mexico too. And Dale saw it and we screeched off off. And he went back and saw it and picked it up, walked 100 yards back, put it through a fence. and. Came back up and said, Did you take a picture? And he says, No, well, let's go find it and take a picture. We went back and it had turned around and went that hundred yards back onto the highway and got hit. Oh. Oh. I mean, and it had to go through Johnson grass about this high. And, uh, just, so, yeah. Mm. But, um, Do you think they might seek out the highway for heat? What's up? Do you think they might seek out the highways for heat? Heat. Warmth. For heat? Warmth? Mm -hmm. I think it's the, the puddles and and the thick vegetation, I think, has a humid, nice humidity. There also might be tadpoles and frogs that are breeding on the roadside that they might want to eat. Well, I think a lot of this interest in highways is 
interesting, but maybe not that interesting because it's really well known that most of the animals that get killed on highways are males. And the <laughs> excess males in population often disperse away from the core populations and end up on highways. I think Phil Rosen was saying that most of the rattlesnakes killed in Oregon pipe were male. So uh, you know, you'd have to study the situation, but you know, there's, there's been quite a bit of study about roadkill like the last few years. But, yeah. Well, there was a, there was an article in the, in the Star six months ago or something about some rattlesnake. Some guy in Phoenix was saying, well, that we shouldn't shouldn't have Interstate 11 because it'll impact the rattlesnake populations. Uh, you know, he implied that a uh, new another freeway would, would hurt the rattlesnake populations. And that completely ignores the ecology that most of the ones that get hit on the highway are males, excess males, and that there's all kinds of, um, the vast area of the untouched habitat is, is out there away from it. That's where the many populations are. So, but. Well, thank you so much, Tom. All right. Yeah. There thank comes you. Lady Harold.